with the webinar in just a second on employee engagement in municipalities and local government. Um, I'll be introducing uh, Norm Bailey David here in just a moment. We're going to uh, start with the, the introduction to the topic. Norm will uh, discuss uh, why uh, we're speaking uh, on the, uh, the topic today. Uh, we're going to discuss some of the uh, unique employee engagement challenges and, and initiatives facing local governments, proven strategies uh, to attack or attract and engage employees, as well as uh, we'll touch on some of the upcoming events that we have coming up at Talent Map that we hope to see you there. And we're going to respond to uh, the bulk of your questions at that given time as well at the end of the webinar. So a little bit about uh, Talent Map. We've been in business for now over 15 years. Uh, we've worked on thousands upon thousands of em employee surveys since our inception, and we have well over a million employees surveyed. Uh, so we've seen um, you know, uh, trends across uh, different types of organizations, uh, different uh, you know, global issues, and on the uh, uh, you know, one consistency across the board has always been that we are, are uh, targeting engagement initiatives. It's our main focus here at Talent Map. So, some of our, our sample uh, benchmarks that we have, uh, we've worked with lots of different uh, public sector organizations uh, across the globe. Some of the, the highlights, uh, I always like to highlight the LCBO as a client of, uh, of Talent Map for those in Ontario uh, know very well. Um, you know, we've uh, worked with the, the, the City of Edmonton, um, the uh, Canada Post, uh, the list is long, uh, but again, the, the main consistency is always around engagement initiatives. The benchmarks are there uh, that we have, and, and today we're discussing trends and what we've seen over the years. From uh, this point on, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Norm Bailey David, who's going to uh, uh, take the webinar from here. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. So, uh, welcome to our webinar once again. Um, I guess the first thing I wanted to talk about is why focus on municipalities and local government. And as you saw from the previous slide, I mean, Matt pointed out to some of our clients that are not necessarily municipalities, but if you were paying close attention to that slide, you would have saw, uh, saw a lot of yourselves because I, mean, I looked at the registration list and saw uh, quite a few of you, so welcome and I'm glad you joined us. But there's also quite a few of you uh, that aren't on that list. So we basically have, have surveyed uh, dozens of municipalities ranging from the smallest counties uh, in northern Alberta, northern BC, to some of Canada's biggest cities, also possibly represented here, including Calgary, Vancouver, Edmonton, uh, and others. So I think we've, by now we've got a pretty good handle on uh, what some of the key issues are in, are in terms of municipalities. And the, the most important thing that or is really driving this webinar is the fact that we can't treat municipalities from an engagement standpoint uh, like any other group. I mean, most of the time, what I'm telling organizations is you're very, very similar to one another, regardless of your sector. And as we work more and more in municipalities, that's decreasingly the case. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to basically remind you of some of the challenges that you already know about with, with regards to employee engagement. But, of course, just doing that, well, you wouldn't get anything out of this. What I really want to bring to bear in, in the next 20 minutes or so, 20 minutes, half hour or so, is what are some of our clients doing about this that's working? And, and what are some of the successful strategies that municipalities of different sizes are using uh, to help improve engagement? So I, I guess with that, I'm going to just zap out myself here so you don't necessarily need to see my mug for much longer, so I'll come back on uh, at the end, and you can really focus on, on the screen in front of you. So essentially, some of the challenges that we're seeing on and on that are facing some of the local governments, and I, I'm sure you're going to be very, very familiar with, and the reason I'm putting it out there is because for each of these challenges, we're going to show you some of the, and discuss some of the strategies uh, in terms of uh, measuring and managing employee engagement uh, that in, that uh, municipalities are, are are working on. Really, there's four. Um, the first major challenge that municipalities face, small and large, um, in terms of you know, the types of employees to survey and to manage, are very very different. Uh, coming from all walks of life, basically, when we're serving, most organizations are going to be relatively homogeneous, 
And most organizations that are concerning themselves with employee engagement tend to be focused in knowledge workers. So a lot of a lot of organizations who are doing this are in sectors like healthcare, in sectors like uh, in sectors like technology, in sectors like finance, also in public sector. But even within public sector, we're talking about primarily the administrative side of public sector. But when we're talking about municipalities, we're talking about a broad range of employees that need to be approached differently, and I'll talk about that. And then there's silos, and silos, in because largely because, as you know, most of your municipalities are structured according to the public services that you render, and as a result, the public service, the service themselves, become entities in and of themselves, which makes it quite challenging to uh, engage from the employees from the organizational perspective. So we'll talk about that. A unique both opportunity and challenge. Uh, facing municipalities that we don't see as well in public in the rest of public sector is the in, is the implication of council uh, and in many municipalities that we have dealt with uh, ranging right up to some of the largest ones in Canada uh, council has been quite active and it takes an active interest in the employees working for their municipality now of course that can get kind of dicey because council all isn't always um, getting involved with the best intentions in mind. So I'm going to I'm going to cover off that piece as well, and it's quite interesting. And then in some of the in, in the larger municipalities, Vancouver, Edmonton, uh, Calgary, um, Ottawa, these uh, the, there's the political pressure isn't really born to bear on the individual employee. They're too distant from the political side. Uh, and don't necessarily interact with council on a, on a frequent basis. But we're not talking about council here. We're talking about most municipalities in Canada, um, even some of the medium-sized ones. Uh, essentially, face this. You know, the, the, you're in small towns. You're in medium-sized towns where, uh, as in, uh, for those of you who remember Cheers from the 1980s, where quote unquote everybody knows your name. Not maybe to that extent, but there is a lot more public pressure when you're out and about in the city. And oh, you work for the city. What are you doing about my this or what are you doing about my that? And that anonymity uh, can place a lot of pressure on employees, especially when we're getting into the senior ranks of management. So, and there's very little distinction at that level, whether it's the CAO level or level or or some of the chiefs or some of the department heads, uh, if you're walking around town and an individual ratepayer or taxpayer has got a particular issue, they're not going to be shy about going up to you and say, what are you doing about that? And so that, that places a lot of additional pressure on a lot of employees in the smaller municipalities. So getting to the big challenge, uh, one of the biggest challenge facing municipalities of all sizes is just the variety and the diversity of the individuals working. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm going to talk about diversity and from the diversity and inclusion perspective in a bit. That's not what I'm referring to here. What I'm referring to here is how do we manage an organization where we've got people working in policy, working in administration, with you know largely university and post-secondary, post-graduate degree university, and we're also working with individuals who are working in parks and recreation, in environmental services, in law enforcement, in emergency services, with very, very different backgrounds, very, very different pressures. Uh, this, this creates uh, quite a conundrum, both in terms of the measurement of engagement. How do you do a survey that you're going to get all people from all walks of life um, to, to essentially take a questionnaire that's you know around 15 minutes and all understand the same things that we're asking. Uh, so that's and of course provide them access to that. So that that creates a measurement challenge. So there's also the management challenge of okay well now we've got the results in how do we manage engagement in uh, you know in our public transit area in our police force where the police is. You know, the police services are part of the overall municipality measurement. Sometimes they're completely separate, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So some of the challenges that we're seeing you face, um, and of course we're going to address some of these. Uh, in terms of accessibility, the first thing that we need to be able to, uh, before we can even go on to measure engagement in the municipality, we have to basically be able to provide access 
uh, to all people, whether you're whether or not you're working in city hall or town hall, whether you're working in the parks, whether you're working in the garage, uh, you basically we need to have to provide uh, access, uh, and everybody has to have equal access to that survey. We also have to take into account, and in many of our municipalities, we have to deal with unions, and part portions of our workforce are going to be unionized. And union cooperation is going to be, uh, although not completely necessary, will certainly aid. A union that's going to fight you all the way is going to be uh, is going to provide much greater challenge in terms of measuring engagement. Um, but then we're talking about remember different education levels, and different education levels we're, are going to read the same question and interpret it differently. So what we have to do is we have to take into account different literacy levels. Uh, when we're thinking about the questions that we want to ask. Now, then there's accessibility itself. And what we're finding essentially is, you know, to get out there, we can't just rely on email uh, as we would. Uh, and uh, many municipalities that we've worked with, from a cost perspective, have basically taken the decision, OK, well, we're just going to reach everybody by email, and then are dismayed when they see their response rates not only are low, but are skewed. Uh, where you don't have a lot of the people who don't have ready access to computers or only have access to their home computers. Uh, so kiosks, survey stations, putting them out there. We've, uh, we work with municipalities where we've set up uh, iPads or, or tablets in, uh, in, in the different garages and the working stations, uh, in, in, um, in, 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 in the parks even, uh, in some cases. And then there's the notion of paper. So and basically what we say here, paper if necessary, but not necessarily paper. What does that mean? What we're trying to do is we're trying to get away from the paper survey as much as possible. It really is a last resort. Um, working with one major city in the West, uh, we've been slowly weaning them off of paper, reducing the amount of paper that they've been using over survey over survey over survey. Well, how do we deal then with those who don't necessarily have computer access through work? They all have an email address necessarily, but they don't. They're not checking. They're on the road. They're they're fixing things. They're picking up. Uh, they're they're dealing with the environment, um, things like that. So how then do we do we reach them? And we reach them through a number of different devices. So you can reach them. You know, the laptop, the computer, your desktop. That's the easiest way. That's how you reach your office workers. But most people nowadays have a phone, whether it's personal or it's come or it's given to them by the organization. They're usually carrying around a phone, and that providing access through phone, uh, a survey you can complete a survey on the phone if you're given 15 minutes by your supervisor. That greatly enhances the efficiency, and it also makes it a little bit more fun than a pencil and paper. So paper if necessary, but not necessarily paper. The other key measurement challenge that we have to face in municipalities is trust and confidentiality. And why do we say that? Well, because in many, many cases, what we've encountered over time is as municipalities began, uh, as most of the public sector, to take much more of a concern and of their, for their employees and, and concern themselves with employee engagement, the first efforts were uh, many of them, in, in many cases, uh, done internally. And when uh, surveys are done internally, data is collected internally, there's an internal pressure for, amongst many managers to go in and to look at their own uh, employees' responses. And of course, that causes for isolated, yet public, uh, public at least within internally within the municipality and the workers, cases of retribution. And of course, that breaches uh, any trust that people have in, 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 in the trust and confidentiality. And then there's also the aspect of just being able to act on the results. So trust not in, in, in the sense of confidentiality, but trust that you're actually going to do something with the result. And so in some municipalities, I've had a challenge over time doing surveys, but because they haven't been able to follow up properly, they've, they're losing the trust of their people. So we have to basically really uh, take a very proactive stance uh, in terms of how we deal with trust and confidentiality. And the first thing what we're going to be doing is we're, any 
pre-survey communications that we're contemplating in order to prepare, to inform, to communicate that the survey is coming, double it. Double it. Double it, not the, the amount of communications, the emails, and, you know, but augment it as well, not only through email and through electronic communication, but, uh, you know, do a webinar in very, very plain language as to what's going to happen, why you can trust the survey, how it's going to be managed, how it's going to be reported, and in the ideal situation, already uh, you can, you should be able to say that administration is taking this extremely seriously and is already promising to act on the results. So in some cases, uh, the CAOs that we've been working with have done that very proactively, and that has had a huge impact in terms of response rates. And the other thing that we're seeing that's working very, very well is identifying survey champions before, or actually better, uh, the better terminology would be employee engagement champions, uh, before the survey even happens. And this throughout the organization. So if you have somebody in Parks and Rec uh, doing that, somebody in finance, somebody in administration, somebody in IT, uh, and their job simply is to, uh, you know, to, to spread the word. The survey is coming. It's legit, folks. Don't worry about it. It really is. Uh, you know, it's not just another uh, paper exercise, quote unquote. This is going to be for real, and you obviously you have to convince them of that before they're going to go champion. But as we do that, uh, then we're seeing that these are credible people within their own communities um, you know, or employee communities, and that's basically working very, very well uh, to promote the survey itself. So the next thing is we talked about silos. And silos are an issue in just about every organization, uh, even small ones. The issue with municipalities is the depth and the breadth and the thickness of those silos. And why is that the case? Because of the, the way municipalities are organized by service. So you've got parks and recreation, you've got law enforcement, you've got emergency response, you've got all of these services provided to the public, library, uh, etc. And the services act very, very independently and have very little in common from a technical point of view. So the, libra the library doesn't really have much in common with environmental services in terms of the service they deliver. And as a result, there's not much really to talk about or to collaborate with. So what actually happens is Everybody essentially is working for their own services benefit, and management is no different in that regard. And there's also a competition, a very healthy competition in some cases, for scarce resources. So all of these are contributing to a, a very, very thick silo mentality and a zero-sum gain type of outcome. Now, employee engagement is very, very different. Because employees, notwithstanding the fact that they're working for any one of these services, want to and need to feel part of a greater organization. So they're not necessarily working for just the uh, city public library. They're working for the city of X uh, or the town of Y. And that's we're going to talk about employer branding in, in a few minutes as part of this. Um, but that's really where the identification and the affiliation is, is important. And why that's important to make that distinction is because one of the key attitudes that drive employee engagement, if you don't already know, is pride in the organization. People want to be able to tell and be proud of the fact that they work for the city of X. And you know whether or not they're saying, I, they're not going to say, I work for Parks and Recreation. They're going to say, I work for the city. And because so that that level of pride is at the organization level, and then there's also the common there's there's also commonality there. So people want to collaborate. They want to be able to learn other other jobs as well, and that's all part of imp improving engagement. But it makes the silo themselves makes it very difficult. So what do we do? You know, what are some of the things we can do? to make sure uh, that we, we work across silos as difficult as that might be. And we've, we've got a sort of a tried and true method over time uh, that's worked very, very well for us and for our clients in doing this. And the first thing is basically to start organization-wide. So what we want to do is we want to counter the, 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 the 
the instinct, let's put it that way, for individual departments to go zero in on their own department results and to think organization-wide first. So and this is just the way we roll out engagement results. So the first thing we're doing is we're presenting organization-wide results to all the managers before they receive individual results. Now that might sound a little bit obvious to you, but in, our, in, the, in the cut and thrust of, of how this actually gets done, uh, usually, in many, many cases, we're seeing, well, okay, we want our executive report, our organization-wide report, but we also want all of the department-specific reports that we're going to disseminate to managers, and they're going to be doing their own thing. Well, that's all, what that's doing is that's reinforcing silo behavior. Uh, and what it also does is it, it will act counter to um, your efforts in terms of improving employee engagement. Why? because you're going to be working, or each department will be working on different things that aren't necessarily contributing to engagement. They'll be working on their pet projects, uh, as opposed to those issues or drivers of engagement that we will have identified, or the survey will have identified, as being important citywide. So it's really important that all managers see what those organization-wide drivers are and results are, before they receive their individual results, and then they can make the comparison. Okay, citywide, we're like this. This is what's important in terms of engagement. And in my own group, we're pretty much the same, but we've got a little bit of a tweak. And the next thing, of course, is a follow-on to that, determining the action planning based on those key organization-wide drivers. Um, so what we find inevitably in, in, in most uh, municipalities, notwithstanding the differences in the types of employees, which might lend you to think, okay, well, it's going to be very, very different. In actual fact, it's a lot of the same things that drive employee engagement in municipalities. Things like professional growth and development. Uh, whether or not we're in finance, admin, in law enforcement, um, in emergency response, um, people want to grow professionally. And so this tends to be a common driver that cuts across. How we feel about innovation is another one. Uh, are our ideas respected? Do we get recognized? All of these things cut across silos. And so we should be able to determine our action planning priorities based on these commonalities and not based on individual issues that might be perplexing any given department, things like communications, for example. And then once that's done, then we, said we identify the three or four things, the three or four drivers, organization or citywide, that are going to drive engagement, then you provide the latitude to departments to use their own initiatives, but over and above, and that's key. Everybody should be working on, if professional growth is a driver organization-wide, everybody should be working on professional growth. If innovation is a driver organization-wide, everybody should be working on in, in engagement. And the most important one, the one that's had the greatest success, is really convening uh, an employee engagement working group, or call it a committee, or call it a task force, that cuts across the department. So you draw people from all the different areas of the city, uh, and basically work you know, a cross-functional employee engagement working group to help develop these organization-wide recommendations. In doing so, what you're doing is you're basically you're cross-fertilizing and you're cutting across the silos. Um, because and you can do that because you're working. Everybody's working on those same drivers. One of the things we say not to do, and it's been the the reflex and the common approach for a very very long time when you get employee engagement results from a survey, is to task your different department managers right away. Go forth and develop your individual engagement action plan. Submit that to HR, and then it becomes what happens is it becomes a bureaucratic exercise. And that's why, over time, if that's the approach taken, you're going to have two things that come as a result. You're going to have a very, very disparate um, a, approach to employee engagement. So you'll have some departments where the managers are very, very keen on it uh, and, have, don't, and are very comfortable with engaging their employees in those types of conversations necessary so they'll include their employees. You'll get very robust plans uh, from there. But in other areas where it's a lot more difficult, Areas like public transit, for example, areas like uh, law enforcement, for example, where there's much more of a chain of command and the command and control style, 
you won't have the same type of thing. So the manager will often sit in their in their office. The, enga the engagement action plan is due the following day. They're resentful. They had a hard day. They fill in something, and then basically there's no follow up. And of course, that creates resentment. And the next time a survey rolls around, you wonder why people aren't filling it in. Well, because that's that approach to employee engagement just does not work uh, very well. You need to include people, and you need to be cross-functional in terms of how we do it. So the next issue here is around managing city council, and this is a, obviously this is a thorny one, and if, um, but it's a very, very important one because one of the things that we've observed over time is many, many city councilors take a keen interest in employee engagement. They want to know and they want to understand what's being done uh, about employee engagement in their municipalities. Most of it, by far, is a bona fide, a true interest by council or councilors uh, in the welfare of their employees. For the most part, 90% of the time, that's the case. However, we also have to be wary about one in 10 cases where it's not always the best intentions. Sometimes you have city councilors who are trying to discredit the administration. Sometimes you have thorny relationships between administration and council. Sometimes you have a very, very combative council amongst themselves. And then what employee engagement becomes is a weapon, uh, is, a, is something that can discredit or something that can be publicized uh, in the local media to discredit uh, political folks. And of course, we don't want to necessarily get into that, mess, that, that gunslinging. But we need to be cognizant that it's going to be happen. But how do we manage through it is pretty much, if we're confronted with that one in 10 situation, how do we get through it? And uh, the, the way we can do it, the first thing uh, I've seen that does not work well is trying to keep it under wraps, trying to make sure, you know, because in normal public sector governance, employee engagement should be the purview of the administration should be. But of course in smaller, especially in smaller organizations, sometimes in larger ones we've seen as well, um, you know, council wants to get involved. So we do need to, we do need to incorporate council or councilors um, in, in the design, the reporting, and the management of employee engagement. Should they be the ones asking the questions? Absolutely not. Um, we have to rely on our expertise and our vendors' expertise in doing that. But they could and should be informed. And if we do keep them informed throughout uh, and we keep them engaged, pardon the pun, in the process when it comes to the results itself, um, essentially we're, it, it, will be, it will be a constructive exercise. But the key here is really uh, having your, your vendor, your external third party involved heavily uh, in dealing with counsel when we're talking about the results. And that third party really provides a buffer it provides the objectivity that's required when you have a tense situation between administration and council. Because it, it, the third party supplier is going to be interpreting the results in a very, very objective manner and doesn't have a vested interest in the, in the political situation at play. And so where I've gone in personally and presented to council in many, many cases, um, you have that, it's a cooling off effect. So council has the op opportunity to ask questions, to, to dig in, to say, okay, well, you know, what does that mean in terms of, of this particular department not managing properly? And so we can essentially uh, assuage concerns, but at the same time make sure that there's no false interpretation that might be agenda driven. And so that's, that, that's been our, our experience and our success in terms of managing council. And political pressure is another one. And now political pressure, this is, uh, if you're sitting in, in a large municipality in one of the big cities, for most employees, this is not going to be a big concern. But when, if you're sitting in some small towns or smaller municipalities or organizations, uh, you might, this might be a, an issue. And in terms of the, the, the issue bears itself in terms of not only having the pressure from management, but put the pressure from the public. Uh, and, you know, whether it's you're at the supermarket or whatever, if you've got that external pressure on you, it obviously introduces a different dynamic. Um, so, you know, I'll get to uh, essentially the, you know, the, how we deal with that. But in, in fundamentally what we're talking about is turning that 
challenge into a strength. And we, when I'm talking about employer branding, I'll address that uh, directly. So you probably noticed by now I haven't mentioned compensation. And one of the major challenges facing most, if not all, municipalities is the ability to compensate our employees um, to market levels. And it, there's two or a number of different dynamics going on, but the first dynamic is if you're in a small municipality, uh, especially with your intermediate and your senior management core, you have to compete with the larger municipalities because you just don't have the resources to compensate to levels that the larger municipalities are. And of course, if you're in a larger municipality, you have to compete with sometimes your provincial or in Ottawa's case, your oh, not just Ottawa, across the country, the federal government. So the different levels of government are competing for you, but notwithstanding the private sector. A lot of those skills are transferable. And yet municipalities um, are, you know, because of the fiscal situation that you're in, uh, have a very, very difficult to do that. Not only that, but politically. You know, so this the salary budget that's the first to go. I'm sitting here in Ottawa and the budget just came out yesterday. And three weeks ago, there were uh, an, about 120 layoffs so that um, the administration could meet its 2% tax increase targets. So it's, you know, it's a political, po politically popular action. There's competing priorities around salary budgets. There's an eroding tax base. Uh, so I'm not basically, you know, this, these are some of the big concerns uh, that municipalities have with regards to compensation. But, you know, is this really a, a discussion around engagement? And the answer is no. Compensation, as we see, I mean, you can see two things here that I put on the screen. The first is a typical uh, chart that we put in our, um, uh, in our engagement studies uh, that show on the, from top to bottom, how employees perceive the different dimensions of engagement. Uh, but from left to right, more importantly, those are the things that have a big influence on engagement. And compensation is usually squarely in the bottom left. What does that mean? That basically means that on average, uh, people are not as happy with their compensation as the average organization. But more importantly, that's not why they're engaged or not engaged. And that's the key here. So of course, compensation from a labor attraction and retention point of view is going to be important, but it's not part of the engagement discussion. And it's obviously, you know, when we're talking about employee engagement, I think really the key here is, that, you know, there's many, many studies done, including our own, but we point to one in particular on the left-hand side. 80% said the quote-unquote work environment is the biggest factor in terms of uh, work-life design, work-life characteristics. This was described as servant leadership, trust and cooperation, work-life balance, credible management. Some might be asking what does servant leadership means. Servant leadership means the perception that leaders are not servants of the employees, but are listening to uh, and in involve employees in decision making. So it's an inclusive management approach. So that's really the, you know, compensation is obviously is an important issue. Obviously it's challenging, but it's a sidebar issue when we're talking about employee engagement. So, so you know, those are the key areas, those are the key differences, and I've already pointed out some of the solutions or some of the challenges. Uh, and the solutions that, that many of our clients are using uh, successfully uh, to, to, to deal with the, those, you know, those, those idiosyncrasies. But what I want to do is go on. There's a very, very interesting uh, study. If you Google it, it's on the bottom right-hand side. It's just, that's the title of the study. And very, very interesting paper there. It's not very long to read, uh, but I'm borrowing from that because the strategies there are actually dovetail very, very well with some of the things that our own clients are doing very, very successfully. The first thing is work environment. And as you saw in the previous slide, the key driver of engagement isn't necessarily compensation. It's work environment. And when you read what work they refer to as work environment, what they're actually talking about is employee engagement. So what are the strategies around engaging employees? First of all, measuring it. Uh, you, you need to measure it before you can manage it. 
but what are the things that are being done in many small, medium, and large municipalities, and the ways of, you know, the changing management approaches. The first one is called listen feedback action. And basically, what, that's a fancy term for listening to employees, feeding back what they're saying, and action. It's, you know, the, way, the best way to, to, to understand this is measuring and managing employee engagement to, to begin with. The next one is inclusive management. And of course, this is something culturally that's only becoming, uh, it's only becoming in vogue in the last five or six years because essentially uh, the way munis many municipalities were run was council would provide the overall direction based on the, polit the politics uh, of the day and the vision of council for the city. Uh, and then CAO and, and, and city leaders, administration leaders, would then implement. And of course, the staff were left to you know do what they do what they said. But in actual fact, what we're seeing is an inclusive management approach where there's a you know a good degree of consultation of staff prior to the to that policy implementation is not only good for policy, uh, but it's also good for engagement and and. So, as we see our municipalities adopting this inclusive management approach more and more, so too is their employee engagement going up. Transparency of communications, key. Couldn't stress this more. If you know it as in city leadership, there's no reason why employees shouldn't know it as well. Now, that being said, we have to be cognizant of something called media, of course. Um, so we have to be careful in terms of you know, pronouncements and things like that, because if the employees know it, so will the media. That's that's a given. But in terms of the internal workings of the city itself and the communication between the different departments, uh, that's, that transparency of communications, at least the attempt to be transparent, is so important in terms of uh, imp improving engagement, as is reward and recognition for performance. That's not true necessarily it just in municipalities. That's true across the board. But everybody wants to be rewarded and recognized for performance in, the, in, in terms of employee engagement in, in, in the cities. Uh, there's no difference there. What we're also seeing is, uh, and I'm hoping there's a couple of folks that have uh, actually done this. On, I've seen you register. I'm not sure if you're actually on yet. Uh, but the use of 360 feedback. So, which provides employees the chance to comment and to help their managers, supervisors, and leaders improve their management processes. Uh, 360 feedback is an invaluable tool, and it really shows employees that managers want to improve the way they manage. And doing that is really contrary to sort of that command and control and it dovetails well with the inclusive management approach. So some of adopting one or more of these strategies is really, really helpful in terms of improving your own employee engagement. So the next one is something probably I'm hoping that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see on this list. And that's called proactive employer branding. So what is employer branding? Employer branding is essentially used to describe your reputation as an employer and that value proposition to employees uh, it's, you know, very similar to, uh, you know, the, the, you know, consumer branding. What we're doing is we're branding our, ourselves as an employer. And the, the key uh, thing to remember here is, of course, it's, uh, it, it's, it's so crucial, not only in terms of engagement and retention, but also employee attraction, uh, which is also a key issue uh, in, in many municipalities. And as soon as we talk about recruitment and attraction, we got to think about millennials. And what are some of the things that millennials are seeking in an employment situation and an employer brand? So what the what city stands for as an employer is a good way to encapsulate that concept. What some of those values, those needs and values are, are very well met by municipalities and especially by smaller municipalities. Let me give you an example. So greater input. Millennials and people going into organizations uh, and obviously those who want to stay in want greater input and influence on policy, on decision making, um, you know, and that greater input in small municipalities is much more evident. So obviously in some of the larger ones, the input and the influence is going to be less. That's the same as true in 
large versus small private sector. But for small, for the, those of you who are in smaller municipalities, you know that great that greater impact on the overall direction of the organization and of the city uh, balances the political pressure that we're talking about. So yeah, basically, if you know if you if you want to stay anonymous and work in a cubicle and have no impact on policy. Uh, you know, your city probably is not the place to be because uh, if you're going to have impact on what's done in Parks and Rec, if you're going to have impact in what's done in city administration, um, and we're in a small town, well, chances are people are going to recognize you. So there, there, you can see that balance and how that balance works out. Um, smaller size means greater engagement, greater collaborative work environment. Also true in smaller municipalities. Greater sense of purpose, that community involvement. Millennials uh, are really turned on by that uh, as employees, and of course, uh, you know th that strong sense of purpose. I can say I'm proud to work for the city of X, and I'm obviously involved in something beyond the profit motive. That's a key attraction and key for engagement, um, specifically among millennials, but not only. Of course, work-life balance, lifestyle considerations. Career growth and development, all policy, all possible. These can all be incorporated in, uh, into a proactive employer branding strategy that's going to serve to not only attract but retain and engage uh, an emerging millennial workforce. So that's really, really key. And the organizations that are the cities that we're working with that are starting that are having great success in doing that. Next is diversity and inclusion. Uh, some of the municipalities that we've been working with have been have had great success with identifying the fact that we need to be more reflective of the community we serve, and that's, that's where this starts. But really why you see inclusion in italics and underlined in this particular situation is because you can't do diversity effectively without having a plan for inclusion. Um, and this is what more and more organizations are learning. We need to tackle them both. If we just tackle diversity from a numbers game, what you're going to get are the, is the backlash around sort of the affirmative action uh, type of phenomenon. But if there's an inclusion plan that's uh, accompanying it, uh, we see actual pride, even amongst the majority, by the way, even amongst the majority. Um, that we're, you know we're proud because we're a more diverse organization than we were before as a city, uh, and that's actually contributing to engagement as well as you know being the right thing to do from a diversity perspective. And the last one I'll talk about is succession planning. And succession planning is something that's not a strategy, not obviously not unique to municipalities, but those that are incorporating that essentially is showing they're, they're providing signals that if we're taking succession planning seriously, if we're providing the opportunity to identify and reward those high achievers, uh, that's signaling career development. And remember, I was talking a lot about professional growth. Uh, professional growth is key in terms of engagement in cities, um, in municipalities across the country. And so how do we do that? Well, there's, if you're going to do succession planning, then you have to do coaching, you have to do mentorship, you have to do job shadowing. Uh, and those organizations that are doing that uh, and proactively doing that type of succession planning are essentially doing two things. They're, they're planning for the future because you know, many people in the senior management ranks are, like me, uh, approaching retirement. And um, you know, we need, we need that succession. Uh, so those organizations that are doing that proactively um, are not only providing the career development of the key people coming up and that engagement, but we're also it, it, you know, managing our, our human resources more effectively. So basically what we've talked about today is essentially are some of the idiosyncrasies of running a municipality from an enga employee engagement perspective. You have unique challenges. You have you, you face unique challenges in terms of attraction, in terms of retention. Uh, some of those successful strategies that we've been talking about, not falling into that compensation competition trap uh, in terms of you know, making employee engagement a priority, measuring it and managing it, leadership development, 360 evaluations. Key here, employer branding, turning some of the perceived weaknesses or the perceived shortcomings of working in a small municipality or even a large one into things that are uh, we can use to attract 
diversity and inclusion is becoming, if not is already, very, very key in terms of engagement in municipalities and, of course, succession planning. So on that note, I'm going to uh, invite you to do two things. I'm going to invite you to ask questions. I haven't had a chance to uh, to look at some of the questions, so I can, you can see here uh, some of you ask questions. I'm going to invite you to uh, ask questions, or not just that, but to uh, provide uh, your own comments or your own things, your, your own KFFs or key success factors in terms of how has it been working for you uh, in terms of you know some of the challenges that you've been facing. So please use your question box. I'll, uh, I'll answer them. And as I'm looking at the questions, I'm going to ask my buddy Matt to uh, come back in, tell you a little bit about where you're going to be able to run into Talent Map uh, and myself, uh, not only myself, my colleagues as well, over the next couple of weeks. So, uh, Matt, if you would. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Norm. Great job. Um, so, yeah, we have a very busy week ahead of us next week. So, um, if you're in the area, we have uh, Canada's Top Employer Summit uh, at the Four Seasons Hotel in Vancouver, coming up on the 14th and 15th. We have HR Leader Summit in uh, International Center in Mississauga, November 16th as well as the Conference Board of Canada uh, and our, um, we're uh, co-hosting that uh, with a workshop, Employee Engagement Practices, Drivers and Survey Design in Edmonton on November 17th, coming up. All right, thanks Matt. So, no problem. getting on to some of the questions and of course um, what I've done here on this slide, you can reach a number of us. Uh, we've, got, we've given you our, our coordinates here so if you're in the West, you can talk to Monica, um, Ontario. So that be, that would be basically Toronto, southwestern Ontario. You can talk to Louis. You can always contact myself here. You might or Matt. Our contact information is there. Two things you should keep in mind: um, many people ask if there's going to be a copy of this presentation and or the recording. Absolutely, there will be in about a week's time. You've got the URL uh, on the bottom of your screen. So if you just want to make a quick note of that um, because obviously you won't have the presentation until you download it. So um, make a quick note of that. And then as you're doing that, I'm going to get to some of these questions which are very, very interesting. So question one here is what if your organization is tired of employee engagement surveys? Are there recommended alternatives? And so thank you, Xavier, for, for that question. Uh, the question you need to ask yourself is why are people tired of employee surveys? So and the employee engagement survey is, I mean, there's a lot of different things coming up. There's called, you know, creative listening, creative employee listening, focus groups. There's a lot of techniques to consult employees. Um, but the employee engagement survey remains the, the most scientific uh, and representative way of understanding what your aggregate employee base and how they're engaged and the measurement tool that you can use to track that engagement. So yes, I understand what you're saying. We encounter it quite a bit in terms of what we call survey fatigue. So why do employees, if people are tired of filling out surveys, there's a reason for that. And I'll tell you the reason that happens the most often, the, the biggest reason why people are quote unquote tired of employee surveys is because there is no perceived action taken on the previous survey. So when that happens, if you feel in your organization that people are quote unquote tired of employee surveys, I wouldn't do one yet. What I would do is use the last one, uh, even if it's been two or three years, and then convene a number of uh, working groups, that employee engagement action plan working group that I talked about before, uh, and rehash some of the, the stuff that was talked about in there. But before you go to another survey, what I would say is essentially uh, you need to act on the information that you have because people are tired of surveys, be, be, not because they're tired of the 15 minutes it takes to fill one out. They're tired of the fact that they're filling them out without any action being taken on them. And that's the biggest predictor of a response rate that there is. So if you're, if you're encountering that issue, that you're uh, what you need to be doing is you need to be taking some action or encouraging your colleagues, your administration to take some action, any action on the previous survey. And that will convince people that, oh, okay, then they're going to use what I'm telling them 
um, and then your response rates will go will go back up. So other things like the length of the survey, the complexity of the survey are you need to look at them, but they're really second in terms of really just taking action on the survey itself. So I'm going to go to the next question. And so Judy, I believe, asks um, if have you if you presented the council open and or closed, and we've done both. Um, so we presented not only the council but also the police services board uh, in open session, um, but we've also presented to council in camera, and that's really a decision uh, of council uh, and of, of course of city administration as well. Um, but we've done both. It probably, uh, of course, the presentation is going to be handled a little, little bit differently if we're doing it in camera versus uh, versus in open session. Um, it's, we're not going to doctor the results. The results are the results. Uh, we're not going to sugarcoat them either in either situation. But of course, if you're in camera, we can have uh, more frank conversations in terms of what are some of the observations, what are some of the things going on, and most importantly, what are some of the corrective measures that can be taken. So uh, I hope, Judy, that that's answered your question. And we'll just check to see if we've got any more. And I do believe that's it. So on that note, folks, I want to thank you very, very much for uh, your attention today. We're just coming up a few minutes short of the hour. It's taken a little bit longer than I anticipated, but I'm hoping that it was very, very helpful. On that note, folks, and on behalf of Matt and myself, thank you very, very much, and have yourselves a wonderful day.